So good morning class. Um, this is our last class together. Uh, we shall meet again in um, in the clinic and also in the clinical vivas and lastly in the examination, which will be on the 25th of um, October. We have marked your clinical rotations as is 10% goes to your vivas, 10% has gone to your logbook. And 20% has come from the four assignments that you handed in. So each assignment carries five marks and 20% um, marks are, are, are rising from the assignments. So that's how you get your mid-term exam, uh, exam marks. Uh, today, we are going to talk about foreign body in ENT. So we shall talk about foreign bodies in the ear, nose, and throat. I have tried to elaborate more so that if we're in a resource limited setting and you are able to refer the patient adequately, you are able to remove the foreign body. But if you are unable, it's advised that you refer to an ENT specialist for um, further management. Um, I have not received an email from the group lead of, the, of group three, which is going to rotate on ENT. So um, I humbly request Paddy to share with the group leaders the logbook via email. And then they divide themselves into two, nine, nine. Nine will come tomorrow on Tuesday. And then the other nine will come, will join clinic on Thursday. We shall have the clinical tutorial, which will be by I on Wednesday at, um, at 10. So I request the group leader to let me know the venue uh, using a phone call when they get the venue for the tutorial. Uh, clinical viper will be on Friday. I also humbly request the group leader when he gets a venue, he communicates to me and we shall assess that out, uh, shall assess them accordingly. So the overview for today is we know that foreign bodies are common problems in the ENT. And uh, we're going to talk about foreign bodies in the ear, nose, and throat, which are especially seen in children. There are many types of foreign bodies seen, and some of them can end up being aspirated into the airway. That is the larynx, trachea, and the bronchus. General practitioners should be skilled enough to remove the foreign bodies with their limited resources. And the general practitioners such as yourselves should be able to remove the foreign bodies. So let's go slowly and see what you can do to help these children or adults. So foreign body in the ear, usually we see these in children older than the age of nine months. This is the curious age group where they, they in, uh, get objects and they end up inserting them in particular parts of the body. It can either be the ear or the nose, or they can swallow and end up aspirating it. In adults, uh, usually we find insects, things that are able to crawl into the ear when someone is sleeping. It could be cockroaches, flies, household and so I have um I have seen a lot of adults coming in with cockroaches in their ears. Um in children the range of foreign bodies is extensive. It can be food particles such as vegetable matter, chewing, uh, gum, beans, candy. Uh, we have both organic, so they are further divided into organic, those are food material and inorganic. 
So food particles we have can be vegetable matter, beans, uh, and chewing gum. So organic, organic we have organic. These are vegetative kind. So we have leaves, flowers, seeds. Majority of the kids we see are usually seeds. Uh, beans, um, orange seeds. Um, <laughs> I've seen a patient put rice. Yes, children do interesting things. Then we have inorganic uh, objects, such as small toys, beads, uh, pencils, and, and rocks. Um, I have also noted um, sometimes when a patient is mentally, an adult patient, when they're mentally disturbed, they end up having uh, rocks. And they can put stones in their ear. And, and sometimes adults come in with a cotton pads in the air, so they they are using the cotton uh, bud to clean their ears, and suddenly the piece of cotton attached to the cotton bud remains in the ear. So that I have also seen in the adults. Um, the vast majority of the items are loads in the external auditory canal. Uh, so this is the external auditory canal. We saw the outer third is cartilaginous, the inner two thirds is bony, and this is the ear drum, or the tympanic membrane. So some foreign bodies can lodge outside here in the cartilaginous part. Uh, some foreign bodies, they start from the outer third, and then they are pushed in an attempt to be removed at home, and they are pushed towards the inner third past the isthmus. So this is the isthmus that junction where we have the osteocartilaginous transition. Although ear wax is technically not a foreign body, however, when it has accumulated in the ear, it can cause the discomfort and decrease. Uh, hearing just as foreign bodies. So uh, the causes of foreign bodies in the ear usually is curiosity. Uh, children put uh, objects in the ear are uh, placed voluntarily, usually by children, for endless variety of reasons. Insects are well known to crawl into the ear, usually when a patient is sleeping. So sleeping on the floor, all outdoors, or in a dirty room can um, would increase the chance of this unpleasant experience. So this is our otoscopy uh, showing you foreign body. So we see this tiny bead, metallic bead. Which is at the, um, at the eardrum. And we also see this a bead. We see it's crystal. This is a crystal bead. And uh, that is on the eardrum and just cast a shadow. This is a shadow because of the light. So it's not a even moment perforation. But as you see, this is a foreign body. Then we also have, uh, this is an insect that has been removed, but you can see this is a moss that is uh, hinging onto the eardrum. Sometimes the insects end up biting um, the eardrum and causing hyperemia of the eardrum. And, and this is wax in the ear. So patients with um, foreign bodies in the ear usually they come with a history of a child having placed a foreign body in the ear. So they will say, my child put something in the ear that they told me they have put. All I was cleaning the child's ear and suddenly I see this thing that should not be there. Uh, um, sometimes patients come in with pain and feeling of fullness, like they feel the ear is blocked. However, children are rarely get these symptoms, or if they get them, they rarely understand them. And uh, young children uh, can also present uh, with, um, if their foreign body has been there for long and is vegetative, it can elicit an immune reaction, which uh, involves reddening, swelling, and a discharge uh, if the patient has progressed to otitis externa. So the foreign body stays in for a long time and elicits an immune response which uh, causes um, a bloody otoria and ear discharge. 
uh, reduced hearing, uh, conductive hearing loss, and nausea and vomiting because of the irritation. Uh, sometimes a uh, bleeding, they come in bleeding because of different items. Uh, that end up traumatizing the external auditory canal when they are removing them. And if the insect is alive, uh, patients will come in with a buzzing sound in the ear. So we should be aware that button batteries, those, those that are in the watch, um, commonly found in many devices and toys can decom decompose enough in the body to allow chemicals to leak and cause agen and cause burn, so they end up causing a burn, otitis external. So agent removal is very, um, is, is, is um, recommended, all is advised. So also agent removal of food and plant particles such as beans because they swell and, and they end up filling the canal uh, is also recommended. And agent removal is also indicated by an object that is causing pain. However, if a patient comes with a foreign body that is non-vegetative or button battery, you can, if it's late and you cannot attempt to remove it, then you can advise the patient to come the next day to have it removed. So you do not have to treat it as an emergency. <clears throat> so, uh, history of uh, is very important. So when we are ascertaining a uh, a foreign body, you have to take history, ascertain the time, circumstances of the foreign body, and learn if there have been attempts to remove, which most of the time we have a um, history of attempts for removal. Sometimes they are successful, and if they are not successful, that's when we, we see patients refer to our settings. So this is a doctor doing otoscopy examine and see the foreign body. So the main diagnosis is usually using a headlight or an otoscope. So uh, you need to examine and visualize. Sometimes when you visualize, you notice that there's no foreign body. So it's important to examine before you make any other attempt. Removal requires knowledge of certain skills and, and techniques, depending on this location, whether in the external auditory canal or the middle ear. So inner ear, it's rarely possible, but um, middle ear, if a patient has a tympanic membrane perforation, then um, you can have the, the, the foreign body enter into the middle ear through the perforation or the opening in the tympanic membrane. Uh, management, small objects, you can try and uh, pull in the pinna and they fall out like a small metallic bead that we noted in the image, in the first image. However, we can have uh, foreign bodies can be removed with several techniques. One, mechanical extraction. We can use uh, forceps, all modified tweezers, but in most of the time here we have forceps, so we can use Tilly's forceps, or cocktail forceps or alligator forceps. So these different forceps are used to grab the foreign body and remove it. Sometimes you can use suction. Suction, um, suction creates a vacuum and that vacuum is able to, um, to bring the foreign body out or we can do irrigation, uh, usually using um, water as we saw in ear stringing. So ear stringing can also be used to remove foreign bodies in the ear especially those that are inorganic. Uh, so we also have other forceps. Uh, this is a hook. This hook is uh, very important when you have um, a, a vegetative foreign body like a bean. So you go in and this sharp end um, hooks into the bean and detracts it. Uh, we have also wire loops. These ones are used to manually remove uh, wax. Uh, this is suction, handheld suction. This one helps to suck the foreign body out. Uh, this is ear stringing. So you can also use water to remove the foreign body. Insects in the canal usually have to be first killed, all immobilized using either lidocaine or mineral oil. And then you gently use. Uh, warm water for irrigation and you remove it. If 
it is not removed by warm water, you can also use um, you can use a forceps such as a tillis forceps. Uh, after the foreign body is removed, you usually prescribe an antibiotic and prevent ear infection, which is a critical channel. <clears throat> which can come from one introduction of water in the ear or trauma in the canal during foreign body removal. Um, kindly note that irrigation is contraindicated for organic matters because they swell by osmosis and enlarge and end up filling the external auditory canal. And in some cases, ear syringing, as we saw, is contraindicated in in tympanic membrane perforation. Um, insects, organic matter, of, and uh, objects that have a potential to be friable and they break, it's better to use suction instead of fossil because they will end up breaking into small pieces. So it's better to remove with suction. If you don't have suction, sometimes you have to be gentle and you remove fossil. Live insects in the canal need to first be removed or killed or immobilized before you remove them, either using lignocaine or oil. Complications of foreign bodies in the ear include otitis externa. So um, it's a common present, uh, complication of a presence of a foreign body in case of um, for, uh, a vegetative foreign body that has been allowed to stay in the ear for more than three days. So it can elicit um, an inflammatory reaction, which can end up causing otitis externa. Uh, sometimes a foreign body, if it's sharp, like, um, like a pencil tip, or if it's a stick, it can cause a perforation in the eardrum. Uh, complications of ear foreign body removal include canal abrasions, bleeding, and infection. So for, for you as a medical officer, if uh, the if the foreign body is inorganic, you can do ear syringing and you remove it. If it's organic and you do not have a hook, it's better to refer to the facility where they have. Prevention of foreign bodies in the ears, really there's no prevention because children are exploratory. So because of their curiosity, sometimes it's, it is the parents who are supposed to advise their children that nothing should enter the ear. And as we have said, we should not, we, we saw this in our lecture, which was otitis externa. We say that the ears clean themselves. So do not use Q-tip cotton buds to get the wax out because they cause the wax to move more deeper and also to harden. So don't use anything in the ear, keep the ears dry and do not apply to clean the ears because the ears clean themselves. So someone shouldn't attempt. Uh, so that is it with foreign body in the ears. So now we are going to talk about foreign body in the nose. As you remember the anatomy, you have the nasal vestibule, then you have the nasal cavity, this is the nostril. Um, this is the inferior turbinate, the middle turbinate, and the superior turbinate. And foreign bodies can lodge either alongside the inferior turbinate or the middle turbinate, or they can proceed all the way back to the corner. So foreign bodies in the nose also can either be inorganic, that is inert, plastic or toys, anything that is non-living. Then we can have organic, which are beans, have battery. We can have insects or we can have toxic material, especially that that is used for gardening. So as we have seen, foreign body can lodge along the inferior turbinate, uh, at the middle turbinate, all in the corner, also in the nasopharynx. A, a child will come in with, when they're fearful, usually they come with a history of my child has put something in the nose or doctor something. Um, my 
mitral uh, roots in the nose. If the foreign body has been there for a long time, they will come with unilateral false smelling nasal discharge, sometimes blood stained. So they'll come and say that they have an unilateral nasal discharge, sometimes blood stained, uh, and it's false smelling. So it has taken quite some time. Sometimes these foreign bodies can, can be in the nose for um, two weeks or a month without the mother noticing. And they may also have excoriation <clears throat> around the, <clears throat> the nostril. And if the foreign body is opaque, is opaque such as a battery, they'll have X-ray evidence. So this is a child with a right foreign body in the nose. And you can see they have excoriation with a little bit of epistaxis, nose bleeding. So dangers uh, of foreign bodies in the nose one is injury from clumsy attempts at removal by unskilled personnel. So sometimes these foreign bodies occur in the village and the village uh, patients, I mean caretakers or the village herbalists, they try to give the patient what we call sniff, sniff, sniff. There's a drug that they use to, to allow the patients to sneeze, so they sneeze it out. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So, and sometimes they try to use um, pins, safety pins, and they end up traumatizing the nose. Uh, also, we can have local spread of infections, such as rhinitis, sinusitis, or meningitis, because of the danger trial of the face. And the foreign body can also be inhaled. If you suddenly push it past the corner, it can go end up in the airway. If a child came in with an inert foreign body stuck in his nose, we could not remove it on the first trial. Sometimes you do not have to make a second attempt. What you have to do is you send the patient back and you allow the child to come back the next day for removal and a general anesthesia. So Sometimes the failures for removing the foreign bodies come as a result of a child fighting and being aggressive. So if a child is fighting and aggressive and you make your first trial, sometimes you have to stop, give a decongestant and an antibiotic and allow the patient to go and come back the next day for another attempt. And following uh, should be done, should be removed immediately if a child comes in. So there are foreign bodies you cannot let sleep over in the child. For example, an insect, uh, a bean, because it will swell and cause an immune reaction uh, in the nose. A battery, because a battery, it will, uh, it will, um, it contains alkaline and alkaline can cause severe, severe adhesions in the nose. So that is an emergency and also toxic materials. Rarely do adults come in with foreign bodies in the nose. However, if they have placed a foreign body in the nose that has taken a very long time, they can have what we call a rhino leak. So particular salts, uh, uh, calcium and magnesium are deposited in a foreign body if it's an inert foreign body that has been there for a very long time, such as let's say if this patient had put me because all a piece of cotton in the nose and it has been there for a long time and it has turned white because the body has been depositing calcium and magnesium salts and it's also hard. So this is a rhinolic. So that foreign body is called a rhinolic, a stone in the nose. And um, a rhinolith after removal. So this one has been removed endoscopically. And as you can see, this is a CT scan image, um, bone windows. And you can see that uh, rhinolith, because of the salt, it's radiopic. You see? So this is a rhinolith image in an adult. So foreign bodies in the nose. Also, we uh, management is removal. And usually we remove them using forceps, particular forceps. Um, most of the time with foreign bodies in the nose, the forceps we use either Achilles forceps 
if let's say the foreign body is like maybe a button or a battery, you just open and, 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 and hold it and remove it. And you can Google T-I-L-L-E-Y apostrophe S uh, forceps on Google to see how it works or how it is, looks like. Uh, sometimes we can also remove them using butterfly forceps. So the insects use butterfly forceps because it, it has a hook, a wide hook. So it goes behind the foreign body and drags the foreign body out. So foreign bodies in the throat. So the most common foreign bodies in the throat are sharp foreign bodies. Um, and these foreign bodies include bones, meat, or fish. Our young children with their natural tendency to put everything in the mouth. So sometimes they swallow a variety of foreign bodies. And I have seen the children having Christmas trees, grass, and um, and also a snail, I've seen a snail in the nasopharynx just hanging from a child who drank, I think, water. And the child kept the epistaxis. And when we did oral pharyngoscopy, we saw for anybody just hanging on the ovula. Oh, yeah, that's dancing, dancing. So the most common sites of foreign bodies to be stuck in the throat include the tonsil, especially the fish bone, anterior pillar, vallecular, and the piriform. Fossa. Remember, the piriform fossa is part of the um, hypopharynx, whereas the vallecular is part of the base of the tongue. So this is your tongue. Uh, so at the base of the tongue here, or the vallecular, that is the space between the epiglottis and the tongue. So foreign bodies can get stuck here, okay? Also in the piriform, these are piriform sinuses on either side of your larynx. And this is your postcricoid region. So as we have seen, foreign bodies can get stuck in the vallecular or the tonsillar bed. Common causes of foreign bodies in the throat usually swallowing without proper chewing. So you, someone is eating in a hurry and they end up forgetting that removing the fish bone which has been there or talking while eating. So when you talk while eating, you can end up having a foreign body in the throat. And um, those with dentures, especially full dentures are more likely to swallow the bone due to reduced sensitivity and inability to chew properly. So <laughs> this reminds me that <clears throat> sometimes most of our patients with foreign bodies in the in the hypopharynx, in the piriforms that are born uh, uh, from elderly patients who have uh, missing, missing teeth and they love meat. <laughs> okay, so we can also have foreign bodies in the larynx. Um, we shall talk more in detail when we talk about foreign body airway, but sometimes a fish bone can can impact in the larynx. And these foreign bodies in the larynx have to be removed. One, as an emergency, because they can cause airway obstruction. And if they're severe and they cause airway obstruction, then sometimes before you refer, you might need to put a tracheostomy in the patient and they have to remove under general anesthesia by a specialized ENT. <clears throat> uh, this reminds me of a child who swallowed um, a padlock. So it was both in the hypopharynx, but it also went into the, into the larynx because of the extremity. And the doctor who referred from Fort Porto had to first put um, a tracheostomy before referral for removal. We have also seen patients, children who have a spirit, who have um, had um, bulbs, these bulbs. So the child is uh, inviting themselves and then they accidentally swallow a bulb. And the bulb, because it has hooks, it will hook in the piriform, but it will also sit in the air in the, it will also sit here. So you see epiglottis is the cartilaginous part of the larynx. So this child, when they swallowed, it hooked here in the posterior wall, but it sat the bulb sat, whereas the filaments were hooking in the piriform. 
so the patient had a prior obstruction from that burning body. Symptoms, how will these patients present? Usually they come in with neck pain, which we call the pointing sign. So they have a particular point where the foreign body is, the patient can particularly touch. Doctor, I feel I have sharp pain here. And most of the time when you do oropharyngoscopy, that is the opposite, in the opposite, um, I mean, that's why you find the foreign body. So they also have anterior jaw pain, they have chest pain, dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing, and if it's involving the larynx, sometimes you have spider that is noisy breathing. Um, and it can be inspiratory, diphasic, or expiratory. It is important to know that on set, how long has the patient had this foreign body? Is it for one day? Is it for uh, one week? And if the patient was able to continue eating or not, because that helps you to know if it's total obstruction or partial obstruction. Or sometimes if they have a history of vomiting, blood stain, then you know that maybe it has caused a big laceration. And I also have to cater for that. And if the parent body has been long and the patient comes in with chest pain or intestinal scapular pain, then you have to rule out a foreign word in the middle part of the esophagus, which is uh, which can lead to mediastinitis infection going to the mediastinum, and that is fatal. Uh, so management of these foreign bodies in the oral pharynx, all in the throat. One, you need to examine. Sometimes when you do oral pharyngoscopy, you able to appreciate the foreign body and remove it, and then either using a magus forceps or a tillis forceps. Um, all are uh, an alligator forceps, depending on what forceps you have. Sometimes you even have, you can use a, a long, straight uh, artery forceps. That can also help. When it's very narrow, it's able to grasp a grasp. So you depress the tongue using a tongue depressor, examine the molecular, the tonsil. So if it's in the tonsil, then you can hold it and come and, and bring it out. All if it's in the molecular or the posterior pharyngeal wall, for example, children who have the second procedure. So for coin, foreign bodies that are coins and smooth, this you can also remove. Okay, in, in your setting by using a, a, a catheter. So what you do is this I've described because you can do it. What, what you do is that you can you the patient has to be taken in theater or under sedation. Then you introduce the Foley's catheter through the oral cavity, push it into the esophagus, uh, balloon it. So after you balloon it, it will form. So you push it in such a way that you um, remember you do this after you've done an x ray. So the x ray shows you the level of the foreign body. So when you go to theater, you push the catheter directly below the position of your foreign body. So once you pushed it below the position of your foreign body, you put the space. You balloon it. And, and after you ballooned it, then you um you gently so you inflate the 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 balloon with five mils of air and then you gently gently track the catheter slowly 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 until you reach the base of the tongue and then you remove the what the foreign body okay so that you can do wherever you are uh, sometimes when a child, when you do an image and the foreign body is no longer in the esophagus and it has already reached the stomach, uh, it is important to discharge the mother 
with uh, instructions to monitor the stool because the child will pass it out. So, um, uh, however, you inform the mother to monitor for the signs. There are signs of failure for the brain body to come out. One, they can also have obstruction, intestinal obstruction from the brain body. So the child will have constipation and failure to pass platters. So they have to come back immediately. Uh, because that means they have to urgently remove the foreign body via expiratory laparotomy. Or if they have signs of um, bleeding, bleeding and nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, or bleeding, then you know that the foreign body is stuck in the transit and they have to be removed by a surgeon. This has to be removed by a professional. Okay. Uh, uh, so we also have, um, most of the time, foreign bodies do not only get stuck in the throat, they can also progress to the, esoph uh, to the esophagus. And uh, foreign bodies that can progress to the esophagus include We have meat. Most common uh, in adults. Uh, we also have for me a uh, chicken bones. Are the most common cause of uh, chicken bones are the most common cause of um, esophageal perforations. Uh, sewing needles for those uh, patients who are sewing and they end up having um, end up having um, 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 ingesting the foreign body safety pins. And in children, we have coins and button batteries. Remember, button batteries are emergency because they can get eroded and they leak alkaline to the esophagus causing severe esophageal erosion, tracheosophageal fistula, and um, also systemic effects. So this is a patient who swallowed um, a safety pin. You can see it, this is your trachea. Okay, your larynx and trachea, and you can see it is in the esophagus, just immediate in, um, after the, the cervical vertebrae, this is the esophagus, then the airway. So this is a lateral plane radiograph. This is an AP radiograph, and you can also appreciate the, the safety pin. So the esophagus is divided into three parts. We have the cervical esophagus, the thoracic es um, esophagus. Uh, we have straight down. So, if has pushed onto 
the anterior wall of the esophagus, it can push, that is the posterior wall of the trachea. So the patient will have partial upper airway obstruction, uh, choking, gagging, coughing, drooling, because they will not be able to swallow, uh, refusal to eat, vomiting, uh, chest pain or neck pain, dysphagia and uh, painful swallowing. So children usually swallow coins, okay? So coin ingestion uh, is the commonest foreign body we find in children in the esophagus. Uh, they usually swallow the 100 shilling coins or 500 and 200. So the 500 and 200, sometimes they are very heavy. So they end up progressing into the abdomen if the child is above the age of two years. But if the child is below the age of two years, their diameter of the esophagus is not adequate enough to allow the foreign body to progress. So the foreign bodies get lodged into the cervical esophagus. And our coins tend to lodge in the frontal, that is called a plane in the esophagus if <clears throat> you have done a, <clears throat> an AP or PA x-ray. Up to 30% of children with coins, the log in the esophagus may be asymptomatic. So if a child has swallowed a coin and there's history, even when they're not drooling or they don't have dysphagia, it is very, very crucial to send the patient for neck chest x-ray. Uh, we have had this many children, we have had like three kids who have complicated because they swallowed coins and they were neglected and they told them you eat food, um, eat um, bananas, they will go, they will, they will go down and the foreign bodies do not, did not progress down. So um, this is an, an epi and this is lateral. As you can see, you have a, a circular radio peak object. So this is a, um, a, a coin and it's in the cervical esophagus. How do you know cervical esophagus? One, you're able to appreciate the neck. Two, it's above the clavicles, okay? And this is the lateral. So if it's ep on AP, it is a frontal like this on AP. And on lateral, it is sagittal. So this is a foreign body in the esophagus. If it was in the trachea, it will be the vice versa. Because remember that if this is the orientation of the trachea, the vocal cords are like this. So the foreign body will be sagittal on AP and frontal, you will have the frontal view on lateral. That is if it was in the trachea. So frequently, so this is a, a foreign body in the mid esophagus. So this is in the thoracic esophagus, as you can see, it's below the clavicles. So frequently they present with mild or moderate degrees of respiratory uh, distress due to the compliancy of the partial wall between the esophagus and the trachea. As we saw that the anterior wall of the esophagus is the posterior wall of the trachea and its membranous. So if the foreign body is big or it, if it has been there for long, uh, for example, more than three days, it can push, as you can see in this image, the foreign body has pushed onto the trachea, narrowing the tracheal lumen. You see the air column? The air column represents the trachea. So you see the foreign body is in the esophagus because of the AP, it's frontal in the esophagus. However, it has pushed onto the wall and caused narrowing of the airway. Uh, how do we diagnose foreign bodies in the esophagus? It's very important to do a chest X-ray, neck chest X-ray. Uh, we had a child who ingested a foreign body and it was a, a zipper. And the doctor who saw them requested for an X-ray but sent for chest abdominal. So they, must, they, missed the foreign, they missed the neck and they missed the foreign body. And I was able to remove that foreign body four months later because the child kept on refusing uh, hard food, 
eating food and losing weight. And um, when we, 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 when, when they came to me and the mother said, but doctor, this started when my child followed the zipper and we asked for neck, chest, abdominal erect X-ray, which is also called a baby gram X-ray. Uh, we found that the foreign body was in the neck, in the cervical esophagus and it was missed. Uh, so chest X-ray on neck films are indicated and usually it's important to ask for two planes that is AP and lateral and include the neck, chest and the abdomen. Consider direct the uh, dilute barium or gastrographin a uh, radiograph if the patient has swallowed a uh, radiolucent foreign body like food and want to know where it is okay uh, when we have confirmed the foreign body sometimes we take the patients to theater flexible Fiber optic endoscopy is the primary choice. However, uh, sometimes you, we, we, if we want to manipulate the, the esophagus and remove the foreign body, uh, we, 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 we do rigid esophagoscopy. So uh, with flexible, usually if it's food impaction, you have to manipulate the flexible to help you deliver the food into the stomach. And once you've delivered the food into the stomach, you come out because the patient will pass it out immediately. And we talked about the balloon catheter, which you can use wherever you are. Uh, for coins that are stuck in the upper esophagus, we can also do direct laryngoscopy. So when instead of resting the blade in the vallecula, as you do when you're going to intubate, we instead lift the entire larynx in the posterior cricoid region. And then we see the foreign body at the inlet into the esophagus and we remove it using a Magill's corset. Uh, sometimes you can use a suction all, but most of the time we use um, a Magill's corset if the foreign body is still up. All we also use a rigid esophagoscopy flash removal using, we have particular alligator faucets which are long enough or crocodile faucets or basket faucets. These are long enough to reach the foreign body if we have done rigid esophagoscopy. Uh, complications of esophag um, foreign bodies in the esophagus, they're not included here, but we can have esophageal perforation if the foreign body is 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 um is 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 sharp, uh, we can also have uh, mediastinitis. Uh, we have lost two children to mediastinitis because the foreign bodies had been there for long and they eroded the posterior wall of the esophagus, which is running through the mediastinum. And, and as they were drinking, food kept on going into the mediastinum and. At the point of coming to the hospital, it was really late. These are called missed foreign bodies. So we can have mediastinitis, esophageal perforation, esophageal laceration, esophagitis, in case it's a button battery and you've left it for long. You can have a tracheosophageal fistula because of the communication of, uh, of the, the anterior wall of the esophagus is, is bounded by the posterior, is also the posterior wall of the trachea. So you can have a tracheosophageal fistula on a foreign body. So those are some of the complications. Lastly, uh, we are going to talk about foreign body in the airway. A foreign body in the air, which is talking, is a medical emergency and requires immediate attention. Uh, the foreign body can get stuck in many different parts of the foreign body and it can lead to death, sudden death in children below the age of one year. Children tend to put things in their mouth when they are bored or curious and the uh, child may then inhale deeply and the foreign body gets stuck in the air with all if a child is having a, foreign, a food particle in the oral cavity and they are suddenly made to cry, they can, because of the, they don't have complete coordination of the mouth and the tongue, they may end up aspirating on the foreign body. Uh, causes of foreign body airway, we have impaired swallow reflex, impaired cough reflex, that is in, in children. We can have mental retardation, alcohol, 
<clears throat> or sedative use. These are in adults, but I haven't, I've seen only one patient yeah, sure. who's. So um, I've seen an adult patient who has recognized. Hello? Okay. So children between the ages of seven months and four years are in greatest danger of choking on small objects. And these small objects include acids. So we have seen children with foreign body beans, um, uh, maize, g-nuts, uh, toy parts, grapes, peanuts, pebbles, uh, buttons, um, pencil covers, pencils. So a child can aspirate on any foreign body that is in the airway. In general, the foreign body have produces three following phases. So when a child has aspirated or choked on a foreign body, the initial is sudden choking and gasping. The coughing all the air obstruction at that time of aspiration. So the coughing is meant to help clear the foreign body. However, the foreign body, once it has passed the true vocal cords, it's hard for it to come out voluntarily. So the initial phase, the mother will say, my child was very well until they were outside there playing with beans. And then they, uh, they started coughing, 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 and then they developed difficult in breathing. So for some foreign bodies, they remain in that initial phase. Talking, the patient continues to cope and have signs of airway obstruction, uh, which include uh, retrosternal recession, uh, tachypnea, uh, bradycardia, depending on how long they come, cyanosis. Um, those are signs we discussed with upper air obstruction. So they'll, they'll come in with those symptoms. And if the child is older, they might undergo that symptomatic phase. So the, the foreign body then lodges into the, maybe the right or the left bronchus and we have relaxation of the, of the reflexes. So when they come into that space, if the doctor or the medical officer is not keen enough, they can end up treating the patient as um, a respiratory tract infection or all uh, uh, pneumonia and the, and the foreign body will be missed for either hours or weeks without, until they get complications. So the third phase is complication. If the foreign body has not been removed within that time, it will produce erosion or obstruction, which will lead to pneumonia, um, atelectasis, that is lung collapse or a lung abscess. So initial phase is coughing. Child was well, they were playing with genets or playing with beans. They suddenly get cough, 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 and then they get <gasps> strider and then difficult in breathing. And that is the initial phase. If a child is below uh, two years, they will get respiratory distress. So you have interest drawing, a use of accessory muscles, cyanosis, lethargy, and the mother will rush to the hospital and there we manage accordingly. Sometimes when the foreign body lodges, if the mother will come with a symptom, my child was well, they played, and now they are okay. I'm not sure what is happening. And if you do not examine well and do a proper chest ex exam, you, you, you will not be able to miss to get a foreign body. So when you do auscultation, you'll find that you have air reduced air entry on the side where the foreign body is blocking the, the airway, like the bronchus. So clinical de presentation depends on the foreign body airway. So laryngeal foreign bodies usually they present with airway obstruction and hoarseness and aphonia, because remember the larynx has the vocal cord. So when the foreign body lodges on the true vocal cord, we shall have hoarseness of voice and aphonia. Like foreign bodies, we include fish, like a fish, all uh, as a hook, a stick or a bone, all um, a toy piece that can get stuck in the larynx. So they will have one air obstruction, 
So all the signs of air obstruction, but they also have a change in voice. It can be a phonic call that is no voice at all, or they will have hoarseness of voice. A trachea foreign body is also present like laryngeal foreign bodies without hoarseness and aphonia. So they will come in with an extra sound, that extra wheeze, yeah, which is similar to those of asthma. But if the patient has no history of allergies, then you have to suspect a foreign body. Why do they have that sound? Is because in the trachea, they allow the sound, the air both when the patient is breathing in and also breathing out. Then bronchial foreign bodies also present with cough. Okay, so the patient will have cough, sudden onset of cough with no fever. Then you, they'll have unilateral wheezing because and reduced air entry. So this is what we call the classical triad. Usually they will have cough, wheezing. Okay, that is wheezing. And also they will have decreased breath sounds on, on auscultation of the, of the lungs. Remember 65% of the patients will feel through the triad. So sometimes, uh, like last week, last week, last week on, on Thursday, I, 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 I was able to remove a foreign body in the, in the airway. The child presented with sudden onset of cough. Uh, to main hospital, I, and um, the sudden onset of cough, no fever. The mother said the child was playing, but she doesn't know what was happening. The child developed cough and wheezing. So when they came to the emergency, they were managed as bronchiolitis because of the wheezing, and they were nebulized and given um, hydrocortisone, and, and, and the patient was disturbed. However, the mother kept on saying, my child is not doing well. The breathing at night, child was had difficulty in breathing at night. So the mother re, re, came back to the hospital and said, the child was not, my child has not improved. Uh, my child is still uh, wheezing and, 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 and had a silent cough and, and difficulty in breathing. So the child had the cough as the first triad, and they had subtle, subtle unilateral wheezing, which anyone could have missed. However, when auscultation, what they had was de decreased breath sounds. And when we went in and did rigid bronchoscopy, so that same child was sent for chest X-ray and the chest X-ray was normal. So sometimes when a foreign body is radiolucent, you are not able to pick it on the X-ray. So a normal X-ray does not mean that there's no foreign body. So when the intern auscultated their chest and noticed that, ah, maybe there is reduced air entry. So they were able to call me. And when we went in, we noted that the child had aspirated on a, on a seed. So they aspirated on a seed, and once they aspirated on a seed, they, uh, they, 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 what? they were able to, that's how, uh, on, a, on a stone, sorry, it was a stone. So that's, I was able to do bronchoscopy and removed it, and the mother was happy. So history is important in diagnosing of foreign body airway. Usually there's history of sudden onset of cough, then a child who was well and playing around something and suddenly started coughing, coughing and difficult in breathing. That is a sign of, that is foreign body airway until proven otherwise for intent. Uh, physical exam, remember I do the general exam <clears throat> and then also you auscultate the chest. Imaging studies and then we later on do diagnostic and therapeutic laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy in theater. So anterior, posterior, and lateral radiographs of the airway are the test of choice in patients with whom a range of foreign bodies are suspected. Chest x-rays, both inspiratory and expiratory, can demonstrate atelectasis on inspiration or hyperinflation expiration with a foreign body obstructing the, the bronchus. So this is an inspiratory foreign body source of uh, chest X-ray, epi. And we can notice that sometimes you follow the aerogram. What does the aerogram mean? The aerogram is the air 
that that flows through your larynx, uh, trachea, then bronchus. So sometimes when you follow that air column, you find that it's obstructed in some lung. Then we have atelectasis. We uh, we have hyperinflation. Yeah, you see, have hyperinflation. So treatment if we have Total obstruction is present. That is the child is not breathing. Whether you're in hospital or at home, the helmet maneuver is still very, very crucial. So what you do for an infant, you give four big blows with the heel of your hand in the interscapular area, okay? And then you follow by chest compression. So that, what it does is that it increases the valsalva or the intrathoracic pressure, and then the patient will cough the brain body. That is in total obstruction. Please remember, in total obstruction, you, can, you have to do the helmet maneuver. However, if you have severe symptoms and the patient needs to be taken to yet as an emergency for bronchoscopy. Um, now, if you are the intern on duty and a child comes in with brain body airway, you always have to administer the ABC. So the airway is non patent. So the breathing might be there, but a little bit compromised. So this patient needs supplemental oxygen as they wait. So you measure their oxygen saturations and note if they're 80, sometimes they can go as low as 60. Then you have to put the patient on oxygen, either by nasal prongs or by mask. However, the mask delivers more oxygen than the nasal, the nasal prongs. So you give that patient oxygen and then you give them supplemental medicines such as intravenous antibiotic, like epraxone, intravenous steroid, like um, intravenous steroid, like uh, intravenous steroid, like um, Dexamethasone, some should people give hydrocortisone, but dexamethasone is recommended. So this helps with the edema. Sometimes if the, you are meant to refer them, uh, in a, you refer them in an ambulance that has oxygen because the oxygen sets can go and hypoxia can lead to cardiac arrest and death. Um, also, we, we need to remember that um, foreign body airway is an emergency. So you have to call for help if you're in a center where you have an ENT specialist able to do laryngoscopy and reading bronchoscopy. So complications, uh, a pile of involvement may cause complete obstruction. For example, the foreign body is in the trachea and the larynx and complete obstruction of the bronchus will lead lung collapse, which is atelectasis. A partial obstruction will lead to emphysema, pneumothorax or pneumomediastinitis, and vegetative foreign bodies lead to chronic respiratory pneumonitis. Uh, so this is an, an X-ray showing um, a lung collapse, okay? This is after removal, you see after bronchoscopy. So bronchoscopy, we have instruments that go through the larynx, the trachea, and they have a light and a channel for breathing and channel for introducing the, the faucet. You go in, visualize the foreign body, and then remove it with a particular um, instrument. So that is all for foreign bodies. Uh, remember, one, foreign bodies in the airway are the most emergency of all, and foreign bodies from, um, from well, that include a vegetative or button batteries have to be addressed urgently because of the complications attached to them. Okay. Uh, and don't forget with foreign body in the airway, you need to know the patient's oxygen salts, the pulse, and also to give them oxygen and IV dexamethasone as they wait for the definitive management. Uh, thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Jamila. We have one list. Uh, I will mm -hmm. request to, okay, there are two. Mr. Buire, please unmute and ask your question.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Jamila, for the lecture. Thank you very much. My concern is uh, two. One is that I realize the scope of our training does not cover emergency tracheostomy. Now, when an FB furnix turns out to be an emergency, what do we do? Can we insert and you cannot intubate, you cannot get it out? Can we put a cannula to help the child breathe as we refer? What do we do? Then <clears throat> the second question was where in a misty FB, I had you mention of something like a misty FB. How do we help that child and how do we diagnose if it is a misty FB? X ray has not showed anything and the, the child still has symptoms. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you okay, so much. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> so the first uh, question was, if you have, um, someone needs to unmute me. So for a foreign body in the, um, foreign body in the pharynx causing total obstruction and you need to put a tracheostomy. Um, one, if you're in a center where you, you don't have a surgeon, that, that is going to be so bad for the patient because the patient will die. However, um, you cannot put a cannula. What you can do is you can attempt to put a tracheostomy if you have a surgeon with you, you can put a tracheostomy. Uh, remember when you stay in the midline above the trachea, there's the, mid, the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, the median raphe, then you separate the strap muscles, separate the isthmus, enter into the trachea. That's where you go through tracheostomy. So you need a surgeon to do that. To a missed foreign body, I have had a patient who had um, a pencil, pencil seal, pencil lead uh, that ended up in an airway and received two courses of anti-TB medicine. So two courses of anti-TB medicine. Uh, those are missed foreign bodies. The key in missed foreign bodies is the history. How did this patient's cough start? How did the patient's cough start? So they will tell you the child was in class. This child was eight years, so he had the history. I was in class, I was playing with a pencil, then suddenly I started coughing. But I think that was known as at the health center. So the patient later developed pneumonia, started coughing pass, and they thought it was TB, on TB negative, but the patient finished two courses of, 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 um, of anti-TBs. So with the missed foreign body one, you need to be very keen on the history. Two, also in your clinical exam. Truly, truly the patient had subtle reduced air entry. So subtle reduced air entry without crepitations also should give you a high index alert for a missed foreign body that it could be a foreign body. And three, radiograph also is very important. Why? You do not have to look for the foreign body. Sometimes it's opaque and you can see it, but sometimes you need to follow the air column. So you have to follow the air column and you'll be able to appreciate the foreign body. So that's how you handle the missed foreign body. One, clinical exam, any subtle reduced air entry is high index alert, especially if there's a history of sudden onset of cough. Two, follow the air column on a radiograph three, um, if a patient has been treated for an upper respiratory tract infection for more than two weeks with no improvement, kindly rethink of a foreign body airway. Thank you. Next question. Kakoza, please ask your question. Yeah, thank you, doctor. I have to have two questions. One was in regards the foreign body in the corona. You say mm. it is done, it is removed through general anesthesia. Mm. So how where is it that we open up and we access the inner the, the inner part of the nose or we still do use instrumentation to remove? 
Then the second point is about, I need some clarity regarding ear cleaning. Is it that when we are bathing, water is not supposed to enter our ear or how do we go about it? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, question number one is Kuana foreign bodies. So when our foreign bodies are the Kuana, then we do, we go under GA because of the risk of lodging, the, uh, dislodging the foreign body and it goes into the airway. So you need to protect the air with the tube in, in, in place. And then we also do what we call endoscopic removal. So you go in with an, an endoscope. So the, in, the endoscope uh, is a small scope that has a, a um, it's connected to a screen. You go in and visualize the foreign body and then use a faucet to remove it. Uh, so we have particular foreign, uh, foreign body faucets that are, are made for foreign bodies in the kuana and foreign bodies in the nasopharynx. So however, we do it endoscopically. We use a scope to visualize the foreign body and then we use an instrument to remove it. Um, um, that is all. Then the second thing is for the ears, as we saw the ears clean themselves, they have what we call the migratory theory of the ear. So all cells, including wax of the ear, migrate from the eardrum towards the external auditory canal. So when you are bathing, you are known supposed to allow water to enter your ears because they have a self-cleaning. All you have to do is to clean the concha bowl and the pinna and make sure your ears are kept dry. Uh, so it's not even advisable to use the key to cotton buds, cotton buds, okay? Because the ears clean themselves naturally. Uh, someone has typed, how about cricothyroidotomy? So cricothyroidotomy is contraindicated in any child below of 12 years of age. Cricothyroidotomy is not allowed. It is contraindicated and absolutely contraindicated in a child who is below the age of 12 years. So you cannot do cannula and refer. And remember, if you do cannula in and out, it buys you only three to five minutes. So you better secure the airway. But you can always find a way to put a tracheostomy. Either using YouTube, don't say I said that. But sometimes when you have a surgeon, you can successfully put a tracheostomy and refer the patient accordingly. Thank you. But don't refer a patient with a complete obstruction without an airway, without a surgical airway. That is murder. Patients die on the way, trust me. OK, last question, I think. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamila. Uh, there was one hand, but uh, I think you have answered the question. I uh, just want to remind you, maybe you send us the notes. Then and we did cover hearing loss. It came in the second yes. uh, lecture schedule you sent us. Yes, you are going to cover hearing loss and tracheostomy in the subsequent weeks with Dr. Ruth. Okay. Um, that, yes, so you cover it with Dr. Ruth in next week and next week part one. Uh, don't forget your exam will have 50 MCQs, five short answer and two long uh, answers. Uh, examinations will come from the, um, the lectures we have given and also your uh, the lectures you've given and also your tutorials and um, at the uh, party help me and share with the, the group leader of this group that's coming in this week the logbook and um, I will see them on Wednesday however the first group I'll see tomorrow in clinic. Um, thank you. Thank yes, you, Doctor. Doctor I have them. Them. Thank you. Yes, thank thank you. you. I have one inquiry. End of same ENT viva. How do we prepare? No, we don't have end of no, same. Okay. Thank end you. of same is only written. <laughs> okay, bye.